Mijuxis, everyone. Welcome to First Foods. So we're gonna get going here in just about two minutes. So thank you everyone for joining us. My name is Desiree Kane. I am a Miwok Two-Spirit living here in occupied Arapaho territory. So we're gonna go through and do our regular protocols before we get the class started. And kicking it off is everybody's most favorite Taurus, Brooke. <laughs> favorite Taurus. Yeah, I am, <laughs> I am very hard-headed and I. Uh, <laughs> welcome everybody to First Foods. I'm a Taino mother living in Matinecock territory and just welcoming everybody back for our weekly classes that we hold on Wednesdays. Um, we're just going to go over some protocols for the class and for the program. So our first protocol is land acknowledgement. We recognize, uphold, and respect Native nations and their lifeways above all else is the ruling governance of Turtle Island and Abiala. Everyone intending this space must obtain and uphold the same. Native knowledge. Lessons learned are not for non-Natives to monetize on or repackage as their own. Native knowledge systems belong to cultural communities they come from and to the guest teachers in our programming. And I also want to add with regards to native knowledge as someone who uh, any community members you may have that are non-native, please understand that native spaces are not something for you to just see as novelty spaces or to take from. We are uh, really requesting in this program and in this space for it to be anti-colonial and pro-solidarity. So when you're in a native space, remember if you to give just as much as you take. The next protocol, intertribal space. Remember that we are all from different nations and regions. So what may be odd or undesirable as food to you might be good to someone else. Respect that and don't insult or belittle. Respect tribal food, land and medicine sovereignty. Remember that the majority of foods are shared by many different tribes, but with different names. Do not try to claim exclusivity or copyright for your own people. It's okay to share the name you know as it is. It is not okay to create dissent over a different name, no dissent over blood quantum or otherwise more Indianer than you fighting. Foraging and harvesting. Always seek permission from tribal communities to forage and harvest these medicines or foods may be seasonal or being left to replenish themselves. Also respect if the answer is no. And also adding to that, if you come from a traditional uh, community, please consult your medicine keepers, your matriarchs, your grandmothers and your grandfathers so that you can get the cultural spiritual knowledge on how to harvest and appropriate uh, protocols around that for your culture and territory. So food sovereignty, first people have the right to hunt, fish, forage, and harvest in their traditional territories. It is unacceptable to critique traditional or contemporary dietary styles as non-natives. So anyone that is coming to this space, if you feel that you know certain food patterns are unhealthy or unethical, if you are non-native, it is not your place to comment on those regards of peoples. And lastly, first foods is for educational purposes only before using or ingesting any herb or plant or medicinal for medicinal or culinary purposes. Please consult a physician, medical herbalist, pseudo professional, a medicine keeper, again, your grandmothers, grandparents, matriarch, and your medicine holders. And I And with that, I'm going to just introduce today's um, teacher. She's um, really well known in the community. Her name is Tekarima Tsukli, and she's uh, Mashika, Waririka, and Chicana. And Dr. Tekarima Tsukli is a PhD midwife, LM, CM, birth and postpartum doula, placenta encapsulator, um, indigenous Mashika Warikiria and Chicana, 
She was born in California and has been living on the East Coast since 2005. Her family is from Zacatecas and Jalisco, Mexico. She is the mother of three boys, all who were born at home in the Temazcal, which is a sweat lodge in English. She is also a midwife, assistant, artist, activist, author, and scholar. She is the co-founder and co-director of Traditional Doula Arts. She is the author of Decolonizing Nahuatl, Mexica, Aztec, Children's Literature, Blooming Flower, Shooting Star, The Boys Can Have Long Hair, Two, currently, uh, those are her books. Currently, she is a home birth midwife in New York, serving about five boroughs and Long Island. So I'm really happy to have her on today. She's going to be covering birth as ceremony, prenatal and postpartum care. And she's going to be covering some um, uh, basics, but also some medicines um, that you should be taking in and around that time of your birth ceremony. So right now, uh, Desiree, is there anything else we could um, wrap into? I'm gonna go get the yep. slides really fast. Sure, definitely. Um, just a intro just and welcome to everyone to First Foods. This is a program led by and made for indigenous people and our allies who are ready for a new day for old ways. And as always, we'd like to thank our sponsor, Ibex Puppetry, for the ongoing support as we build this program that makes critical knowledge available from the culture bearers that hold the oldest knowledge on the continent, something so many of us need at this time. So the title today, um, if you did not see the graphics that Brooke made, which are, I mean, I'm just always impressed at how beautiful they are. Um, the title is, Birth as Ceremony, Prenatal and Postpartum Care. So with that, we will turn it over to Tikarima to introduce herself and um, teach our class. Thank you everyone for coming. Okay. Hi, can you hear me good? Yep, you're good. Okay. All right, well, uh, thank you for having me here. I'm uh, Dr. Tekari Matisi, and I'm a home birth midwife, I'm currently licensed and practicing in New York and New Jersey. Um, yeah, like Brooke introduced a little bit, um, my family originally were from Mexico, so from the states of what is now known as Jalisco and Zacatecas, but I was born and raised in California, and I've been living on the East Coast uh, the past 14, almost 15 years, um, New York, Rhode Island, Connecticut, now New Jersey. Um, and so, yeah, my family ancestry is Mexica, Wirarica, we're peyote people, um, danzantes, but I grew up Chicana, indigenous, and... Uh, I have three sons. I'm a single mother and I have three sons. They're um, 13, seven, and five years old, Ashaqua and Tlet. Um, and yeah, they were all born at home on the earth with the fire in the sweat lodge, um, with the community helping and really just, you know, honoring birth as a ceremony. Um, I uh, completed my doctorate degree in in the University of Rhode Island and Rhode Island College. It was a joint program in education. Um, and then I went back to school and, and, and it was enrolled at uh, SUNY Downstate Medical Center in, down, in Downstate Brooklyn. And um, that's where I did the master's in midwifery. So I graduated in May, 2019. In November, 2019, I started my home birth practice and the name is Siwapatli Midwifery. Siwapatli is the Nahuatl word and it translates to Siwat means woman and patli means medicine or herbs, plants. So it's like the herbs and the plants and the medicine of the women, medicine women. So that's um, one of the plants too that, that we use in, in active labor as a tincture to get the uterus to contract and get uh, labor going, baby out. So I wanted to honor that plant and, um, and chose the name of my practice to be Siwapatli. And so Siwapatli Midwifery started last November, 2019. And um, 
I've been around birth though. My son, the oldest is going to be 14. So this November 16th. And uh, so for the past 14 years, I've been a birth worker, as Brooke mentioned, a doula and then midwife assistant. And then now with my home birth practice. Um, and yeah, I, um, I'm the author of six books. So um, Brooke mentioned some, and then um, the next slide shows the, the ones related to birth. I'm a danzante uh, for many years now, and um, I love to work out. So I'm a coach too with um, Team Beach Body, and um, yeah, I uh, ceremonial person. Um, you know, part of the Telcali Quetzalcoa is our Native American church chapter. So as I mentioned, we're peyote people, and you know, just very connected with the plants, with the medicines, with the elements of life um, and birth, uh, life and death, right? So um, I'll introduce that much about me for now and then go on to the slides. So today I wanted to talk about uh, like prenatal care, the importance of it, what goes on in prenatal care and then um, birth, a ceremony and then, and then um, the postpartum care that period to that journey. So that's my website, Siwapatli MC. Um, I'm working on becoming a nonprofit. So it will eventually be Siwapatli Matriarch Council. Um, and the idea behind that is a lot of the women that I'm serving, um, indigenous, brown, black women, I, and coming from low income resources, the idea with the nonprofit is to get um, grants, grant money to help make home birth possible for low income families who normally couldn't do it because at least in New York to have a home birth, the fee goes from $8,000 to $11,000. In New Jersey, it's from $5,000 to $8,000 or more. So it's really hard sometimes to have a home birth because of the financial part. So see what badly makes you our council. The idea behind that is to um, bring home birth to some of the families who really, really want it and, and um, the finances is an issue. Um, but for now, um, see what Patli midwifery and um, that's my website, that's my email. And then the next slide is uh, just a picture of me with uh, the two books that are related to birth. Because one was my dissertation and then a young adult novel, children's book, and then um, as Brooke mentioned, traditional doula and midwifery arts, our first three years doing doula and a birth and postpartum doula work. So those are those four books. And then these two, um, Birth is a Ceremony and My Body, My Birth, are the two books that are available on lulu.com and are related to birth specifically. So Birth is a Ceremony is about the use of Hikuri of peyote um, in pregnancy, in birth, postpartum, um, and then some other uh, plants too that we use. Um, some of my sisters from down south, the yahe, the wachuma. So there's 18 birth stories um, from women throughout the world, indigenous and not, um, with the use of, of uh, strong sacred medicinal plants in our pregnancies and births and postpartum period. So that's birth is a ceremony. And what I have found like concluding, you know, it's a quick read, but it's just that, you know, like the, the hikuri, the peyote has been used for thousands of years. It just depends from indigenous community to indigenous community where you go and the prayer behind that um, on whether or not you can, uh, consume the medicine in pregnancy and birth. So it, it's different all throughout Turtle Island, throughout Anahuac, the ones you do. Um, and what I found is that uh, regardless of if it was thousands of years ago, 500 years ago today, um, is that no matter the use of, of how much, little or a lot of the medicine in pregnancy, there's no malformations, no congenital anomalies, no issues with babies because of mothers having these medicines in pregnancy and birth. Um, so Western medicine, uh, the pharmacokinetics breaks down the use of these plants way differently than the way we pray and use them. Um, but yeah, this book is uh, pioneering that work in terms of, because uh, there's 
thousands of books on peyote and other medicinal plants, but not in birth, in pregnancy. And, and, then, and then, so the idea with this book was to start, you know, sharing some of those oral uh, stories, birth stories of, of women who we have um, had our pregnancies and stay close to the fireplace, to the fire with these sacred plants and our children, our beautiful medicine babies, you know? So um, that was the idea behind that book. And then the other book, My Body, My Birth, um, I was, you know, advised that as a new home birth midwife, it'd be good to have uh, a, a book available to all moms, um, all people interested in, in birth. And, and this one talks about some of the plants and, and then um, just, you know, some of what I'm gonna talk about now, the, the prenatal pregnancy uh, discomforts, how breech birth is never gonna go away. And it's also normal. Um, and then the postpartum care, which is uh, really important. So that book, it's a quick read. It highlights some of just like, you know, it's your body, your birth. You should um, be the number one advocate for that. And, um, and so those are the two books with, um, in terms of birth. And then the next slide shows my logo. And um, there's a whole story behind that. Um, but if you've ever seen the clitoris in 3D, um, that was, this logo was taken from that. So it's kind of honoring that balance of, of um, Western and traditional uh, midwifery philosophy. Um, and so in this version of that is uh, the fire and the water on top, the Atlachinoli, the our first mother and father, um, and the balance of masculine and feminine energies. So that Lachinoli and Nawa is like when the water and the fire come together, make love, make life. So that's at the top. And then they also say it represents kind of like the half moon and then the altar. So in there are the phases of the moon, which is related to the water. And, um, and then, you know, from like the Huichol, Huirarica traditions, I was taught that um, there's a place in Mexico called uh, Cerro Quemado out there in Huiricuta. And there's different stories throughout the world, right? About how the world came to be, how life came to be, how birth is. But um, we have an understanding that, you know, the that's where the sun first uh, was, was born, came sunrise, and then, you know, with that comes the uh, tobacco, one of our first medicines. So that's the tobacco flowers on top. And then the peyote with the peyote flower and then the corn. So the tobacco, the peyote and the corn are our first medicines, foods, and they're all one in the same. And we have them in our altars at home. And they're connected to our lives. And, you know, we teach our children we're people of the corn. That's where we come from. Um, we're people of the tobacco, people of the peyote. So that's just honoring those sacred plants, foods. And then um, and then the little flower there is the siwapatli, which is uh, the one I mentioned earlier. So, so yeah, with this logo, I wanted to just um, um, have represented the plants that are sacred in my life that are related to birth, that are helping us to birth our children at home. And with the fire, with the water, on the earth, with the air, with the elements, with creator, like that, in a beautiful way, with that balance of masculine, feminine energies. Um, so, and then just always thankful, right, to our grandmother Moon for how she moves the water. So that's that. And then the next, yeah, the next slide is um, pretty much. Um, so. There's a, you know, a lot of different home birth midwives do it, do it um, a little bit different, but there's a consensus that most prenatal visits are monthly until 28 weeks and then bi-monthly until 36 weeks and then every week until your baby's born. So some people are always like, you know, 40 weeks, that's it, that's, that's your term and anything over is post, but then, you know, there's an understanding throughout the world too that, anywhere between 37 to 42 weeks and sometimes a little bit over 42 weeks is still okay, you know? But um, it, throughout um, 
New York and New Jersey, depending on the hospital and the, the protocols, that's uh, things flow a little different. But um, for home birth, this is uh, the, the scheduling. And then um, I have here, this is from my website. So as, as a midwife, I'm there for mom and baby. It's your body, it's your birth. I'm just here to help you with your birth, you know, and support you, your baby, your family and any fears, you know, a lot of moms sometimes have fears, worries, concerns. So just there to trust your body, to experience birth as you want it and to really honor it as ceremony. And um, so, yeah, like there's, um, we like to have sometimes mother blessings for some of the moms who are okay with, with that. And mainly a lot of the indigenous uh, women that I know, they all have one, but then, you know, we try to share the traditions with other moms, some yes, some no, but um, it's a really beautiful ceremony or mother blessing where like the mom really in her, you know, prenatal time is able to just um, put out either into a stone that we bury into the earth or write those fears on paper that we burn or, you know, just, just release any worries, any fears, any concerns. Cause especially like right now in these times with the pandemic or different issues going on, uh, doubts come into the mind. So it's, um, it's important, you know, to like let that go to just and um, to trust your body yourself your mother your grandmother your great grandmother whether we were connected to them or not you know because i grew up as a ward of the core in foster care and my relationship with my mother is a little different so i've been meeting moms then you know pregnant people pregnant moms along the way with those um, similarities and so sometimes you know there's hard times in our life that have affected us but that's why the prenatal care is really important because it's, it's yeah, we'll do those 15 minutes of OBGYN care where we check your blood pressure and, you know, your temperature, your pulse, your listen to the baby's fetal, the heart and, you know, do all the, the vitals. Um, but then it goes beyond that, right? There's a checklist and those are the next slides that I'll talk about about what we do. Um, but then on top of that, it's not just the physical. It, there's there's emotional, mental, spiritual responsibilities, ash, issues, actions that need to be addressed too. So then, you know, like that that so in this prenatal care, it, it's um, and a lot of midwives would I'm sure agree that it's it's more than just a, a midwife mom related and, and the mom I don't like to call them clients or patients. I always call them my moms. You know, my mom. So as a midwife and all the moms or pregnant people that we're serving there's a relationship and, and it's just not midwifery care, then sometimes, you know, we have to change those caps, which can be, you know, like a counselor or a psychiatrist, like different, it just depends on your experience on what you, you know, on what you've been in your life. So in the prenatal care, there's a lot going on and we can go on to the next slide and, and it shows a little bit of, um, I tried to like, condense everything into three slides with the prenatal care because it's a lot you know the 10 months of being pregnant or nine months 10 nine months it's a lot so in the initial visit and there's you know what I've been doing is uh, someone contacts me whether it's through you know uh, word of mouth friends um, ceremonial women sisters that I know or then sometimes social media, the websites and Instagram, Facebook, you know, so, so when someone contacts me, I'll send them all my documents by email and then we'll have a consultation either in person or through Zoom lately and then go over um, any background information. So I like to have a questionnaire, you know, where they just share who they are, their information and pretty much why, you know, why a home birth. So, um, because I, re I really believe, you know, like to have a successful home birth, it has to come from the mother. It has to be, you know, her idea, her want, her desire, her vision, her plan, her prayer, her way of life of seeing how to give birth at home. Um, so we get into those details. And, and in this pandemic, what I've learned too is that 
you know, our people, they've been crossing the border from Mexico to the United States for many years um, with fear, right? And, um, and some get caught, some don't. A lot of us, uh, you know, that's how our, the journey started here after the conquest, after the genocide and all that. Um, and they did it with fear, but it still got done. So some people are like, you know, you can't have a home birth if you have fear. And, and, I, and I, I don't sit well with that because I'm like, yes, you can, because our people are always, you know, crossing borders and doing other things with fear and it still gets done. So we just have to work through it, right? Talk through it. So that's like a, a big piece. And that's done at the initial visit. There's lab work, all the first trimester labs. There's, there's a lot there. Um, prescriptions for prenatal vitamins. Some moms are into the ultrasound, some moms aren't. Um, so uh, sometimes usually the first one is, is done between like eight weeks and, and 11 weeks, um, six days, right? The first sonogram. And then the second one, if they want it, is a 20 week anatomy full scan. And then if, if the, those are fine, um, or some, some moms don't do the first one, they'll do the second one maybe if they want to. And then if those are good to go, then um, they don't need any more unless they go past you know, those, those uh, post dates, with, with, which is like, uh, they'll go on to do a biophysical profile. And that's once they're, um, if they make it past 41 weeks. Um, so there's, there's those, but if something were to be wrong with that 20 week anatomy sonogram, then there would be like fetal growth sauna. So what this, what the sonograms, I'm spending time there because that's been a big question throughout the prenatal care. It's been like, you know, people, moms will call me and they're like, should I do it? Should I not do it? What did you do? And, um, and then they read the, the studies on how it fe affects a baby or it doesn't. And, uh, and then some just, you know, really want to see the baby. So, so there's a controversy mix there. But, um, and again, this is all with home birth, right? Because uh, it's different in other places. And then we'll also address, you know, weight gain. That's, uh, uh, it just depends by your BMI, um, your body mass index, and where, you, where you're at. And some moms, it's a big deal. Some moms, it's not. Um, the exercise diet journal, water intake, um, that also every prenatal, it, it's, we address it. Um, but you know, I've, I've had friends, midwives tell me, and, and I, I agree, it's like, um, there's moms who eat really, really healthy foods, you know, all organic, non-GMO, the best of the beds foods, they can afford it. And, um, and yeah, they have beautiful, pregnancies, birth and everything. And then there's the moms who are very low income on WIC, on SNAP, can, you know, barely afford certain foods for the week and, and um, or they eat out at, at, you know, fast food restaurants. And, and I had a, a midwife friend said, you know, it, you can, the idea is to always eat healthy. You know, it's, it's beautiful when someone, you know, has their garden and they're eating, you know, fresh veggies that they planted from the seed and, and, and then it's in the kitchen and it's beautiful. But in, you know, moms who are eating at fast food restaurants, it, it doesn't necessarily mean they're gonna have, you know, not be able to have a home birth or not a, a, a beautiful birth or birth that ceremony, you know, it, it's just regardless of your diet, like the baby's gonna keep growing. But of course our, you know, recommendation suggestion is always to try to eat the best healthy foods. Some moms are into the three meals a day. Some moms are into the five meals a day. So that is, um, you know, some moms do go all out and do their journal the, by the week, some by the month. Um, but it's really something we spend a lot of time on and it's important um, to have, you know, the, the whole nutrition and pregnancy to have a good first mom, healthy body, and then baby, healthy baby, right? So and then along with that, all the vitamins. So not just the prenatals, but sometimes there's the iron vitamins. Lately, it seems, you know, everyone's anemic. Um, so, and, 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 and so the iron supplementation, different herbs. Um, uh, I'll share later some of the ones that I, I, 
I like to use in, in the prenatal care, like the red raspberry and nettles, but there's a bunch. I was, I'm in the office right now and I, I'm looking at all the ones I have packaged, but there's a lot of herbs. Um, we also talk about breastfeeding, of course, in all the, in the prenatal care. And um, that's, you know, the way we were taught as indigenous peoples is the breast milk is where the, the ancestral memory of our people lives and that's being you know given to the baby so all those good foods all those strong plants you know all that is given to baby through the breast milk and and they're connected um to our ancestors like that forever and and you know there, there's also that topic controversy about well if i wasn't breastfed you know how do i connect and and that's why you know there's there's ways and 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 that's where the plants and all this healthy food original foods from our people come into play and make a big you know play a big role in in having that connection to the ancestors every prenatal care visit we also go over fetal movement um especially towards the end fetal kick movement the um Again, we do a full history of the substance abuse, sexual abuse, relationship issues, family medical histories, all that is part of that first initial visit. Some people are into the genetic screening, others aren't, you know, and that's a big question. Like if I, um, what would you do? What would you do if you have a baby with Down syndrome? You know, are you gonna keep the pregnancy or not? So some parents are like, yeah, I wanna know. And others are like, I don't care. I'm keeping this baby regardless. So I don't want any genetic screening. So that's another controversial one. And then um, a physical exam, we do the review of warning signs. And this is, you know, initial, initial visits. So th this is someone, you know, in that first trimester and we'll go over those preterm labor, premature rupture of membranes, preeclampsia, any bleeding, that. And then I'd like to introduce the rebozo, which is the, a shawl um, um, that I'll talk about more in the postpartum. So that in a nutshell is the initial visit and it's very much condensed here, but I wanted to share that much there. And then go on to, um, so the next two slides are on routine visits, right? So then, there's always that first prenatal care visit. And then I'll, like I said, every four weeks to your 28, every, then biweekly to your 36 and then weekly. So this is everything that we'll cover. Choosing a pediatrician, your postpartum support plan, how to prepare, you know, to avoid any tears, um, the birth certificate. It, it's what I'm finding throughout the boroughs. It's, it's online for the five boroughs, but Long Island upstate, there's, you know, forms, Jersey, it's online. Um, your birth plan for the most part, whenever a mom comes with a birth plan for a home birth, like we're pretty much, yeah, that's what we do. So, but there's some moms who are very into details. And so it's, it's nice to go over all that. The birth supplies, um, some midwives have it where you just order the kit online in their name, or some of us do all the ordering ourselves and package it ourselves and, and um, have a few little extra different things like an obsidian knife that I'll talk about later. Uh, some women choose water birth. And with that, I'll just spend a little bit of time talking about how like uh, meeting throughout, you know, the Americas with different indigenous relatives. It's like, um, you know, there's the idea that, or, um, there isn't a consensus because there, they, you know, some indigenous peoples have been, you know, our people never gave birth in the water. You know, our babies are in the sacred waters for those nine, 10 months. And then they're supposed to, you know, that first breath of life be in the air. And, and so there's that idea, but then others are like, no, no, no. Our babies were always born in the water. You know, we had those beautiful, sacred, clear waters in the cenotes or, you know, the ocean and so babies were born in the water um and so throughout it's been interesting finding out like throughout the through turtle island and now walk the one how like there's that controversy about water birth versus air birth and so um for those who choose of course to want to have the pool then um we have those available for rent the car seat the signs symptoms of labor when to call the midwife all that, you know, in all these years, 14 years going to birth as a doula, midwife assistant, and now as a midwife, I've only ever missed two. And so, and it wasn't on my, 
on my uh, <laughs> on my uh, responsibility is just mom's called when they were crowning ready to push. So um, there was no way I could make it right. So if those situations um, were on the phone and walking her support team through all that but you know we go over this in those visits on like that 511 411 311 on on when you know the midwife should start making her way over there um depending where you're at early or active labor do you have a doula or not a support team or not so we go over the the roles and then some people want photography some don't I find that a lot of us uh they're like there's no photo of me giving birth um anywhere in social media or anywhere at home. And so I just wanted to respect it that way. But, you know, I'm thankful to all the people who do post all that. And um, that's how we learn, right? And then that's how we see those in-call births or breech births or twin births and all that beauty. So um, some people have photographers, some don't. Again, the food preparation throughout the prenatal care is really important, but then also that food meal train postpartum, right? So we'll go over that. The different inductions at home that are natural. So the, a lot of the, the homeopathy um, um, or acupressure, acupuncture, um, um, nipple stimulation, just walking, you know, there's, there's, there's different ideas. I don't really like to do the whole castor oil. And if there's questions about that later, we can talk about that. But um, those are all the natural inductions, right? Um, we always have that plan B of, of in case of a transfer. So the review transfer plan, even though some people are like, you know, if you put that out there to the universe, that's what's going to happen. So let's not even talk about it. Let's not put it out there. But it's not about that, right? It's about always having a plan B in case of a true emergency. But in my 14 years, the few transfers I've seen have been like where the research says due to maternal exhaustion and not a true um, emergency. So, but we do ha like to have that a handout filled out with like the specifics in case of a true emergency. Um, and then also talk about overall well baby care. So are you, you know, co-sleeping? How are you wearing the baby? Reboso, what other things, you know, any well baby stuff. Um, we go over that expected due date and talk about that, how it's just a guest date. And, um, and then like uh, the post dates, if you do go past the 40, 41 weeks, 42 weeks. Um, I know one mom who went to 43 weeks um, and then uh, vaginal exams at home where we don't really do too many of those. So we'll talk about that if they want one. I know in some hospitals that's routine and they start doing them at 37 weeks. Uh, don't even give you the option. So at home, it's always more like it's your body, your birth. Do you want this or not? And I I haven't done ever a vaginal exam in, in uh, pregnancy and I have done limited ones in labor. Um, and then the biophysical profile, which is looking at the five, uh, that's the one if you go post dates and looks at five different components, the NST, the amniotic fluid, breathing, tone, movement, and there's like a, a score, you would get two points for each one. And then if you're eight out of 10, 10 out of 10, you're good to go clear to keep having, you know, the weight. But if you are six out of 10 or less, then they push for an, uh, an induction in the hospital. So that's in case you go past 41 weeks, three days, and then they're done every three days until you get birth. And so that in a nutshell is some of the stuff we cover in the prenatal care. And then there's another slide and I'll try to go a little bit or, or that, or, okay. So then those were the two um, prenatal care ones. Um, this these two herbs I wanted to share. So this one is the, I don't know if you can see it here. It's the red raspberry leaf. So this one and Aviva Ram, if you follow her on Instagram, she's really good. Uh, she's a doctor and a midwife. Uh, and she, um, um, I like following her, her, her videos, but uh, she has shared too recently about um, the red raspberry leaf. And we like to use this one. Um, the first part just talks about a tea versus an infusion. So we recommend always the infusions. I used to drink like a, a mason jar every day in pregnancy. So the red raspberry leaf, it's pretty much, you, the uterus is a muscle, right? And so this leaf helps to tone it. 
and we suggest the recommendation is to start taking red raspberry leaf in the second trimester. Um, so, and it has all these benefits, right? Right here, the, all the vitamins, all the minerals, um, vitamin C, E, calcium, iron, A, vitamins A and B, and potassium, all this is in that one. So this one, and just like that, you would you know, boil some water, put, if you're using a mason jar, a part of the red raspberry leaf to five parts of water, let it sit. I would let it sit overnight, um, steep right for four to 10 hours, it says right there. And the morning I would just add some ice if it was hot and drink it like that. Some people like to add some honey. And then the other ones is nettle, nettle leaf infusion. And that one also is really rich in all those vitamins, A, C, D, K, calcium, potassium, phosphorus, iron, all that. Um, and like I said, a lot of moms tend to be anemic. So this one is good to start taking from the very beginning. Some moms have even gone out to get just the capsules or you can get the um, metal leaf yourself and just grind it up um, and make it into powder and then put it in capsules. So that's the singing, the nettle singing leaf. I get all this stuff online on Frontier Co-op and if anyone's interested, I could always email you some of the other recipes, but there's a uh, one like the nettle, uh, nettle balls, we call it. It has the nettle leaf, if you like almonds, honey, um, oatmeal, flaxseed, and they're just little protein, you know, nettle leaf balls. So that's, those are the two that I rec would recommend. If you take anything from this PowerPoint, it's to um, share and tell all moms, any pregnant people, that you know about red raspberry leaf and nettles. Um, yep, and then the next photo is, uh, so that's in a nutshell, the prenatal care, right? And I, and I really believe that in order to honor birth as ceremony, prenatal care is really important because like the, the, the nettles, right? We want you to be strong in iron to avoid a postpartum hemorrhage, to avoid any complications, any issues like that, right? So. Um, it has happened, especially in these times where some moms wanted no prenatal care. They, they weren't going to the hospital. They didn't want to do any of that. And, and so sometimes, you know, some home birth midwives don't want to take you because we need to know what type, you know, what's your blood type and what, uh, do you have any, you know, the medical history, right? It needs to be known, but yeah, there have been a few moms who just do the prenatal care themselves. Um, and then we'll go to like some quest diagnostics diagnostics or any other labs and get blood work done and stuff so but I I really push you know get those prenatal care visits in and 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 sometimes moms have three or four but a good recommendation if we follow that every you know the the protocol of every four to 28 every two to 36 and then weekly you should get a good 13 15 visits in those nine ten months but some come at it with like two or three or none so um yeah, that's really important. And this is just a photo with some of my friends, sisters from A Mother Blessing. Um, all right, we can move to the next slide, which is, so birthday ceremony, I put this teepee up that we just still in my backyard, actually. We had a, a ceremony here last weekend. And um, and I, I always say in there, you know, like, um, to me, the best ceremony, the most beautiful ceremony, and I know it's not about competition or comparing, but it is birth. Um, and a lot of these ceremonies, altars, fireplaces, whether it's the teepee, the sun dance, the moon dance, the blechas, you know, when they talk about the chanupa, all these, all these ceremonies, sacred instruments have to do with that, you know, balance of masculine and feminine energies or are structured after a pregnant person giving birth. And, it, and so I always like, um, when I'm at birth, it reminds me of a lot of these ceremonies. And then when I'm in ceremony, I'm like, you know, it's like birth again and, and, and not bringing in no Christian way of thinking or any of that, but it's just like being born again and being every day, you know, it is that way with the sun anyway. So pretty much for a home birth, once you're 37 weeks, you're cleared to have the home birth, right? So anything before is preterm labor and um, we don't carry like the, those 
steroids for the fetal lung maturity for home birth. So that's why, because some moms are like, well, what if I don't make it to the 37? Like, can I still have a home birth? And um, like, no. So, so that's starting at 37 weeks. I'm on call. Um, and, and just uh, like I said earlier, su support you with your body, your birth, the way you envision it, and really honor birth the ceremony with all the love and respect. And, you know, we have a direction in our, in our Nahuatl way, and that's the West. And that's the representation of the thunder beings of Shipetotic, of the warrior women, the water women who give birth, the life givers, you know. And and so, like I'm very connected, of course, to all the directions. But when we go outside this teepee, we pray like that. Like I'm always thinking of all the moms and the birth the ceremony, and connected that way with all of our mothers and sisters and aunties and grandmas and grand you know like that so um we can go on and on and on about birth as ceremony and what that really means and i and that is something also in the prenatal care that that we talk about because you know that term is thrown out a lot birth as ceremony but what does that really mean you know and and how to how to live that so it's a really beautiful way and i really honor and thankful to all the moms who who make it happen that way. So I'll share that much on that. And then um, the next few slides are postpartum. Um, so the first picture is of the burning of the cord. Um, and I talk about it with moms in, in, in the prenatal care more towards the end, once you hit 37 weeks about the options. Like, do you want the scissors and the plastic clamp when it's the cutting of the cord? Or do you wanna use the obsidian knife and like a buffalo sinew or deer sinew or the flax seed with shells that, you know, are, are like protection seeds in your traditional way? Or, or do you wanna just, um, um, what's the other option? It's the, the burning of the cord, the obsidian knife, the scissors, and or the full lotus. That's the picture I couldn't find earlier. So a lot of moms are more into that now where we don't even cut the cord and the, the baby and placenta are together for about four or five days until it falls off on its own. So pretty much after the birth has taken place in the immediate postpartum, like we call it the golden hour, um, while we're waiting for grandmother placenta to come, I just, I like to just step back, right? Of course, I'm watching uh, to see when that placenta for the signs of separation and when, you know, she's going to birth the placenta. Um, but I give the space to, to the family, mom and mom, mom and dad, or just mom and relatives, you know, like, it's a lot of different factors nowadays. So I just like to you know, make sure everything's okay. And then, um, but yeah, these were the pictures that I wanted to put there because um, uh, there's options, right? At home. <laughs> and then this is a beautiful midwife and um, teacher, Angelina Martinez. Um, this was a photo from, I went this March to Mexico uh, and she was teaching um, about the postpartum care and there's a bath that is done also. Um, and so she, she, there's a lot of herbs that we use in there. And that's like the, the first postpartum bath for the mother. So um, in here I have, you know, that the postpartum visits, I like to do the one like once the birth happens, I come back either one or two days postpartum and then either one week or two week, the four week and the six week. So there's four postpartum visits that I do. And um, um, later after your, your 40 days postpartum is when there would be that bath and then the bajo and then the closing of the hips with the rebozo and you know, processing the birth where there was like beautiful, beautiful or traumatic because there's a balance. And, um, and so all that's done in the postpartum visits. And then the next slide, um, yeah, it explains, you know, so there's those postpartum blues where it's like the first two weeks, some moms have it, some don't. 
depression, anxiety, postpartum, you know, all that it, it is real. It's happening and it's hard. Some moms never talk about it. Some open their heart to you. Some it takes a lot of trust to get to that. Um, but um, I'm thankful to the moms who do trust and, and give that and then how we can help with that. So with our traditional indigenous, I like to call it scientific technology, right? And I always give thanks to Panketsani Tisi from Indigimama as I took her Acerrar Las Caderas online course and, and you know, um, learned a lot from her there. But what I like to bring to my practice is that for some moms, not everyone, but the temascal postpartum, sometimes that closing of the hips with the reboso is done in the sweat lodge. So, and then the bajos, um, and, the, and there's photos following. And then the sits baths, the herbal baths, that was the photo previously with um, the Parter Angelina Martinez, the belly binding massages, all that's part of the postpartum care. And I feel it's really, really important because when we give birth, not just our sacred space opens, right? Everything opens. And then the cold air came in. So the idea with all this is bringing back in the warmth, is bringing back in the heat, the closure, and um, it's physical, mental, emotional, spiritual work, you know? So this is all part of the postpartum care for the moms who are interested and open and want it. And some might have it all, and some might have one or two things, so. Um, that's that. And then that's just a photo of the Temascal um, that will be covered, you know, so that's in there is where like my children were born there on the earth, the whole if you've been in the sweat lodge is in, that's in the centers usually to the side for the birth so you have space and then in the postpartum. Um, we'll do the four rounds of the sweat lodge and then the last one the people will exit so the mom has space to lay down and then the rebosos will be under her. You could use one, or you could use all seven. So that's that photo. And then um, we can move on to the next slide. And, and that always is the closing of the hips in the sweat lodge. Sometimes some moms are like, can it be in my living room with the AC? And yes, it can. So we do it like that too. <laughs> and then this is uh, my godson, Byron. Um, he made this for me and he carved in my logo and the side, Siwapatli Medwifri, and this is for the bajos. So some of you know them as the vaginal steams. And again, uh, that's a lot of the herbs I have here in the, in the home um, that, uh, that we'll use. And, and the bajos are good to help, you know, postpartum with the bleeding um, and bringing in some of that warmth, heat. It can be done the next day and then every day and um it gets really hot so the first when you boil the hot water and put the herbs that you want to put uh I like especially the rose hips in there it smells really good you know there's a, there's a lot of herbs and and if you contact me I could send you info but um then the bowl goes directly on the bottom and then you just sit there for like 10-15 minutes and if you don't have one of these stools and I used to always just put the bowl in the toilet and then sit over it or squat over a bowl, but you probably want the little pads for your knees. And so that's a good 10 minutes. And um, it's the bajos, the vaginal steams, and, and even not postpartum pregnancy, a lot of people, women just use this um, once a month with your moon cycles, or even if you're past the moon cycles, as it's known to help with fibroids, with uh, menstrual, cramps with a lot of things. So the bajos, it's like really a vaginal steam, sauna, and people love it. So that's that one. And then the next slide we have, um, that's the belly bind. So the bang kong, and um, depending on the size of the mom, you know, 13 or 15 yards should do it. And it's a uh, uh, muslin fabric that um, you can like this one is sewed at the bottom sometimes they're dyed and it you know they say it's not good to wear corset postpartum right that can displace all your organs but this one right here this manta is just a fabric 100% kind that will wrap around and, and it and it is kind of like a corset but natural and it's um, you can wear it all day long just take it off to sleep you can do it yourself there's videos where 
uh, you can do this. And this really helps a lot of moms really like it. And it's, it's not just to flatten your belly. It's just, you know, it helps with your, your, the back pain, your posture, and really bringing back, um, you know, like I said, when we give birth, everything opens, all those bones, everything. So it's helping with that. And this is done sometimes, you know, uh, every other day or, or every day for those first 40 days and even beyond, because we're always saying, you know, the 40 days postpartum care is really important, not just the 40 days, but for the next 40 years and then some, right? So this is, um, uh, that this was shared with me. Um, and then here's the photo of the closing of the hips and the bones with one reboso. So this was actually for a mom that I did it at the Shinnecock powwow last year. And um, it was really beautiful, like the whole, whole experience, like just feeling the ancestors there, seeing the baby, and then, you know, starting at her feet and the focus concentration is on the hips. Um, but it's uh, the, the recommendation is to do this three times at least postpartum. And, and this is focused on postpartum, but it's not just for that. Like the photo of Angelina Martinez, the midwife there, she had shared about how the reboso is our heart and extension of our arms. And there's, you know, a whole history with the rebosos of how we used it prenatally in birth for labor positions, postpartum to carry our babies, to bury the babies who didn't make it. The reboso has a, a long history. And so um, it's not just for birth related though, is what she was saying. It's, you know, sometimes men need this too. There's fertility issues sometimes, not just with the women, but men. And then, and then this is good closure to anytime you have an accident, car accident, different accidents, or, um, you know, any trauma in your life, a divorce, you lost the baby, you, you know, a miscarriage, an abortion, different issues that go on. Um, intimate partner violence, we've been seeing a lot of that lately. So the reboso is like that, like, a, like I said, the heart and extension of your arms and part of our ancestors' uh, ways or our, our people's ways to help, you know, bring in that closure, that love, that support. And it's physical, emotional, mental, uh, spiritual, and it's, it's really beautiful. And like I said, it could be done in the mascal, in the sweat lodge, or in your living room with the AC. So that's that. And then... That's just another uh, few pictures of, uh, there's a bunch of different types and sizes and they all cost differently too. I've been to Reboso fairs from like $10 to thousands of dollars throughout Mexico. And it just depends on the fabric. But for these, 100% cotton is the best. And the last photo here shows her with all seven. Um, and, and then you stay like tied up like that for a little bit and then, uh, get a good blessing, limpia, with uh, the different um, herbs that we use or medicines, copal, palo dulce, um, sage, cedar. Yeah, so that's that's usually done. We like to say 40 days postpartum, right? So six weeks postpartum. And then the last slide, I think, are we, or almost to the last slide. Okay, so this is a postpartum tea, one of my favorites that I, I I give credit there to Bunket Sun EPC. Um, and it's the manzanilla, chamomile, the red raspberry leaf, and the yarrow. And I have all those here, but i um, watching the time too. And so, and then it has the, the Tlal Quetzal is the Nahuatl name for yarrow. And that one is to help stop bleeding. So this is good as a, as a tea immediately after you give birth to drink and then to keep drinking. Um, um, so I wanted to share that tea there and you have it there. And um, that's one of my favorites that I share with all the moms. And the next slide we have is, yeah, so that's the last one. And those are my three sons. So Tlewitzin um, means the hummingbird of the fire in Nahuatl, Ashayaka is the face of the water, the oldest. Tlewitin is the baby, he's five now. Asha right here in the middle is 13. And then Colteo is uh, seven, the spirit of the eagle. So I just wanted to share with them because, you know, like birth the ceremony, it, it, even though like Asha was two days and Kual was eight hours and Tlet came out flying three hours, like 
And it, even though the years go by, like every day you remember, you know, th those births and especially being around birth and it's just really beautiful and, and it's the most sacred. And I always say like, it doesn't end at birth. They feel like, you know, people care about you while you're pregnant and everybody wants to be at the birth. And then comes the postpartum period. A lot of people just disappear, bounce, you know, like uh, I go missing. And, and that's when you need the most support. Like there's, you know, all this info on how, and all the, the statistics and all the women who die in the postpartum period. So it's like um, that postpartum, support care is really important and it, it's it's a uh, it's not just the first two days or two weeks four weeks six weeks right like i said it's like the whole the whole lifetime and and so it's it's really beautiful when the family and and friends and that support system is there so i went a little over the hour but i was trying to uh when i was making the powerpoint get as much info shared here about the prenatal birth the ceremony and the postpartum period so i think brooke said we, we wanted to open up for questions um so thank you <laughs> for listening thank you everybody so at this point we're going to go into our q a section so you can unmute yourself and if you have any comments statements uh birth stories birth traumas we want to share yeah, you want to go? All right, yeah. <laughs> Good evening. Um, I just have a quick question. Um, my cousin, who is like me, Mexica and Chaki, married a Mexican woman about 20 years, years ago, and she had all three of her sons squatting. Um, is it really true? that squatting when giving birth is less painful compared to lying down, which to my understanding is, is a colonial practice. Please correct me if I am wrong as I am a man, I will never know what it's like to give birth. I will never experience that wonderful gift that all of you say, sacred women here share. I was just wondering if any of y'all could answer this for me. Thank you. Yeah. Um... So I have seen some women give birth on their back a lot, especially in the hospital, but in the home birth, um, yeah, squatting is uh, the number one position that I like uh, a lot of women to also enjoy hands and knees, but um, the squatting, like, you know, it's kind of like when we go to the restroom and you're sitting, you know, anytime for a bowel movement, like who, who, who has a bowel movement laying down? Like it's, it's just gravity <laughs> that position helps to give birth. And then I always like to share, um, her name's La Soteo, right? As the, um, the original piece is in, um, in Mexico in the museum and she's made of jade. And if you see, she's in that squatting position, right? And, and they say she has that Jaguar medicine. Um, so the idea is to, push baby squatting, but also with the mouth open. Um, and it leads to less complications and it's easier to push versus having your mouth closed and your chin tucked to your chest and pushing for 10 seconds. So I always like to show her cause I'm like, you know, she's squatting. I gave birth to all three of my sons with the reboso over the willows squatting and just pulling on those. And, and yeah, it helps to also the way the pelvis is divided into those three sections um, to open the pelvic outlet, um, inlet, midlet, you know, it helps with all that too. So, so yeah, good that your, is it your friend, sister? I don't know, uh, did that. And, and, and a lot of the women who I know give birth that way. It, it's, um, there's no, there, there's less tears too, you know, like uh, with that, so. All righty, well, thank you very, very much. Uh, I think we have, um, next up is Rayanne Madison. She's actually was our teacher last week. She's teaching on breast care, but Rayanne, if you want to speak or I noticed she had a statement in the chat. There. I'll just read her statement then. I think she might be probably away. Can you talk about your midwifery school experience and how you decided to become a licensed midwife? How do you balance mom life with on-call? 
Oh, she's rocking baby to sleep. Okay, that's why she, sorry. Yeah. Yeah, well, for me, um, you know, a lot of what I learned at SUNY Downstate Medical Center, I'm, I'm thankful for. Um, and, you know, I, I am grateful for everything I learned there. And I had really amazing preceptors and then some really, really tough ones. Um, but I've also seen midwifery care in Mexico and Colombia and my friends through Peru and New Zealand, some in London. So I know that, you know, there's Western midwifery and that's what we were taught. Um, but then there's indigenous midwifery and then beyond that. And um, the, it, it, some of the things are similar, but then there's a lot of differences. And so I always, you know, I tell my moms that like, I, I'm thankful to that program and, and everything I learned there, but midwifery is not just that. And there's a lot more to it, right? And, and so I'm thankful to all these like, other midwives worldwide that have shared with me and and then in the end like with a lot of the moms in the prenatal care what we talk about is really like then them bringing in their culture and their traditions and some are connected and some are disconnected and so then it's like helping to you know bridge some of that um but i i, I always say i um I love our indigenous way of life and we're, you know, we get, I remember when I was like, I'm going to write a book about the use of peyote in pregnancy and a lot of people were against it and were like that, you know, that, that that's illegal, that's a drug, all these things. And so, and I'm like, no, but our reality, the way we live it, the way we see it, it's not. And, and, and it, it's okay. You know, it, it's good. And so that balance, I feel like people on the red road, they, they honor it. And I feel people in the Western, you know, educational system, it's that way and that's it. And so there's a clash. And so there needs to be more respect, dialogue, discourse around all this. And, you know, at the same time, I, I don't hate on, on that education. Um, but I always say like, if one of my sons were to break, you know, their, their arm or something, I'm gonna take them to the hospital, right? And then I'm not just gonna like smudge them off at home with copal, but I will once we get home. And 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 so it's that balance. But um, but when we first get sick with something, we always just treat it with the tea or you know go into the sweat or into a ceremony. Like like that's the thing. I've, I've seen how our, our plans have helped women who were told that they were never ever ever going to be able to have children to be able to get pregnant to sit up in a prayer humbly with you know the sacred plants and then have a baby. And, and, and it's, it's just beautiful how the medicines, that miracle and, and Western medicine doesn't understand that sometimes, you know, so, or many times. And so that, to me, it's that balance, but I, I feel like I have a community license and it was a lot, a lot of work, sweat, money, blood, sacrifice, you know, my children were in, in Texas for 10 months while I finished the last part of my integration. It was a lot of work. It was really, really hard. It took me six years to get this license. And I'm just like, it's a community license. And and I know a lot of midwives too, and people who kind of do it underground and all that, but I'm, you know, a mother first, a midwife next. And I feel like I needed that, those papers to do the this work and, um, and it's 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 all good. Like uh, it's been going good. I've been really blessed with this with the Siwapatli midwifery practice and the teachings there, and then the teachings um, beyond there. <laughs> yeah. So next we have Phoenix uh, Anaya. She's actually another one of our teachers. Oh, our teachers are on tonight. <laughs> she was on before talking. Actually, the first uh, class she was talking about um, me different types of medicinal medicines and stuff like that. So she has a statement. So Anaya, if you want to talk about the appropriation and how birth is seen as a condition, so I'm gonna give the pass the mic over to you. Hi. Yeah. So my daughter is a kind of um acting out right now so if you if you hear some some screaming you know it's because she's not trying to go to bed anyways so um yeah in allopathic medicine she was just saying that you know pregnancy is not celebrated or it's it's not seen for really what it is because by modern uh, medicine because 
modern medicine, allopathic medicine sees it like a condition, like, like the way that they see like a disease or an ailment. It's, it's a condition that you're in that you will be cured of soon enough, you know? And so that's how they kind of treat you. It's like very robotic and very um, <laughs> um, detached, you know? And let me go see what's up with this. Hold on one minute. <laughs> So um, also she was also mentioning before, oh, Tsinkala, if you want to come on and talk, you could too. Tsinkala Mati, are we? I don't know. Are you able to unmute yourself? I know that, um she was really encouraging of you also in the Facebook live that we're doing right now. So Hello? you're getting a lot of love. <laughs> and lots of toddlers. Oh, Rayanne said this is power toddler hour because <laughs> Sinkala, <laughs> me too, because Hatway was acting up. He didn't want to sleep. So none of the toddlers are sleeping right now during this uh, class. So, um, She's in the living room with her toys and now I'm back. So I was saying about the appropriation is that I noticed she was talking about um, the vaginal steaming and stuff like that. And I've, I've been seeing a lot lately all over, the, all over the world, like Dubai, you know, Kuwait, Bahrain, um, all over the States, all over Canada, all over everywhere, all over Europe, like this vaginal steaming thing that um, people are doing and they're offering it as like, you know, a health thing for pregnant women or after you give birth and whatnot. So I'm seeing from this class that it's a, it has indigenous American roots from our relatives south of the US border. And um, I'm seeing that it's appropriated. They took it, colonialism, you know, they took it and now they're, they're uh, monetizing it, they're commercializing it. And, uh, you know, um, they the, the, the specific type of uh, body binding or um, the, the bones to, to close, the same type of thing. I'm seeing it as well all over the world, you know, and, I, I, and they say, oh, we got it from America. Oh, this, these people so-and-so in, in the United States or in Canada came up with this revolutionary method. And it, uh, <laughs> it's indigenous. So yet again, we see appropriation and colonialism in something else with our peoples, <laughs> you know? So I was, I was, uh, I think that's what you were asking me about the appropriation or the- Yeah, the cause you had, made a, that I was talking about. you had made a statement on it. And I think it does happen a lot in birth work, um, especially renaming of things i'm sure Tekarima could probably talk more on it like one example i know is the the mayan uh, womb massage i know it's called now it's named after a white woman i don't know the name of it but i think it's named after a white woman now but it happened so i don't know if Tekarima, you want to talk more about appropriation and birth work and, and yeah i um credit. all that that she mentioned is is true um and i was thinking as she was talking about how like in, in medical school, in midwifery school, a lot of even all the like, like the Barthlins and the Skeens gland and all the, like a lot of our, our, our body parts are named after white men. And then how I remember going to um, the farm in Tennessee, you know, the whole Ina Mae Gaskin um, community and then learning there, because I heard before about there's a lot of these maneuvers and things are named after white men. And then there's only one, the Ina Mae Gaskin maneuver, right? That's named after this white woman, but she got it from an indigenous woman from Guatemala. And, and, and the story is that in, in terms of a shoulder dystocia, so, you know, the baby's too big and the shoulder gets stuck. There's a few maneuvers that we do, but we have five minutes to help get the baby out. And one of them is called the Ina Gay Mask Gaskin Maneuver, named after her, 
but that came from this indigenous woman who had a dream and was like the pretty much the maneuver is just you you know you flip over and you put one of your legs depending on where the baby's back is into running lunge right so to me, I was like, well, why was that? You know, why wasn't this indigenous woman given that? You know, why isn't it called the Guatemalan maneuver? Or, or you know, like why? And they said, oh, because, you know, Anna Megaskin, she's really well known and who knew this native woman and da, da, da. So it's like, yeah, there's a lot of appropriation, not just with like our body parts, but like some of these maneuvers, the reboso, um, you know, like it's, it's a lot. And my thing is like, if someone's gonna use you know, uh, a traditional indigenous way, then just give credit to it. Like why take it and, and rename it and replace it or, you know, and, and yeah, there's the, that, but everything she mentioned is, is true. It's, it's a capitalism, patriarchy, like it, they all like benefit, contribute, take from it. And, um, and, and I've been in many, in many circles where you know, we're like, you're a culture, uh, you know, appropriating the, the reboso and, 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 and you'll um, be attacked. Really heated. So it's important yeah. to just keep, yeah, uh, we have to keep talking about it and, and, and knowing the source of where it comes from. Right. And then acknowledging and then, and respecting that, but it's, it's crazy. Yeah. And you will probably get attacked too, whenever you try to bring it up and talk about Hey, well, you know, you know, this is where it actually comes from. And this is, you know, the, the, the person who actually did it. These are the peoples that it came from. You know, they will turn around and they will start, you know, attacking you. Settler fragility. Start telling you, oh, you always want to make it about race, you know? Oh, you always want to make it about whatever, you know, they gaslight you. And, it, you know, I realize um, European settler colonialism with its, its packaging of supremacy, you know, it, it's gone global. Because if you think about it, all of these places in the world is it's freaking global like you know dubai bahrain india you know these are all places that have also been colonized by by europeans and when you look at them they they are taking things from the americas indigenous to the americas and they are bringing it over here you know to to the other side of the world and selling it and appropriating it and it's, it's so acceptable to even the rest of the world, you know, it gets to the point where you'll have an Arab or an Indian or an Asian, you know, do the same thing. You know, they have, they have sweat lodges in the Philippines, you know, with Filipino shamans, you know, printing out things from, from, from memes from Facebook, you know, picture of Geronimo or something and stick it on the wall and make it part of their little lodge and say, I'm gonna give you a vaginal steam, you know, with, with some ayahuasca, like they, they blend everything. And when you tell them, hey, this is wrong, you know, and try to tell them why and where it comes from, you know, because they have also been indoctrinated with this, with this settler colonialism, they will say, no, 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 it's okay, because this white guy who started this, this little, you know, resort, um, you know, he was, he was allowed by some shaman in Peru somewhere, you know, to give you ayahuasca, steam your vagina and stick Geronimo's picture on the wall next to Sitting Bull, you know, like, they do this, you know, and it's, it is traumatizing. There's a lot of stuff going on. And it really, really is touching me that I see in your class, like these things like the, the steaming or the, the, the womb massage and stuff. And I, I see it on the other side of the world. They're bringing it to North Africa. They're bringing it to, to Asia. They're bringing it to the Middle East. You know, it's in Turkey. Yeah, it's global. Our, our, our appropriation is global, you know? as all I have. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, all, all, all this, all this care, is, it is needed too worldwide. It's needed. And, and, and I've been in circles, you know, the only Chicana indigenous person with all white women and, and I still stand firm that fine, use it, help them, but credit where it comes from, respect mm -hmm. that, you know, acknowledge it. Don't just take it, rename it, replace it, make money off of it, you know? Like even all the rebosos we get, we get them from, you know, the midwives who know the families who make them and that money goes to them, you know? Whereas over here, yeah, you'll go to a workshop for two, $300, pay so much money for and And none of that goes back to those indigenous communities, you know? So it's mm -hmm. just everyone kind of 
sees it a, a different way. But my 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 thing is like all people, regardless of you know the race, class, gender, sexuality, if if I can help them, I'm gonna help them. Mm -hmm. But you, you know, it, it there's there's a there's a a specific community that I, I, I really serve and that I'm really working hard so they can have, you know, what we, what we rightfully deserve and, and, and need. Mm -hmm. um, Cause you know, our, our communities and, and, and the struggle. So it's like, we got to bring birth back and it's happening. It's happening one mom at a time, one birth at a time and, and dismantling all of that stuff, all of it and and having our children at home you know so that's just my focus but it's really hard with some people it definitely is i just want to kind of recap what you and phoenix are saying because it's very important especially for we have a minority group of of allies and non-native people in the group but what phoenix is talking about if you want to and and largely what takarima is talking about is really settler colonialism but also indian fetishism right but in a weird way through birth work so that's what they're talking about so those are the things that you might want to research because i also don't believe in too much free labor for you guys you got to do the research but settler colonialism indian fetishism or romanticism and the other thing is settler explorer culture so what they're doing is they're saying oh look at this cool little thing you know, let me bring it back home because they have a museum mentality uh, towards people that are a people that are living. So when it comes to birth work, it's not free or exempt from that. And I think it's really important to understand that anti-indigenous or pro-colonial rhetoric is global. It's not regional. It's not in the past. It's happening on an everyday basis but because indigenous people face such large amounts of invisible racism it's seen as non-existent there are other um, minorities or, or groups of people that experience more visible racism it's in front out there more more visibly aggressive but for indigenous people it's always a subtle racism and that's because indigenous people are largely seen because of settler colonialism and racist history as figments of a past and often a past that has that's not even real it's like a really phony constructed past that um, puts us in a landscape towards a settler story so understanding these elements is important and doing your research as people who may be allies or, or non-indigenous in this space uh, we I, I always say challenge settlers and colonists to look at those things and say, well, how can I help now? Now that I know this, what do I do? You know, now that I'm here and I've unlearned something or I've learned something, what do I do next? So important to understand these things. And I just wanted to recap that because those are really important messages that Takarima and Phoenix are giving out there. Um, and it applies to more than just birth work, uh, uh, unfortunately, for Indigenous people. It's every aspect of our cultures and peopling. Well, that was my spiel on that. If anybody has any other questions, I do have one question for Takarima, but I want to wait to see if anybody else has questions or statements, comments. Okay, well then I have a question. So I had to give birth in a hospital. I was planning on a birthing center, but that didn't go well because I wind up getting a really severe preeclampsia like a month and a half before my due date. And they couldn't, they tried. I, I, went, I wind up going to emergency Woodhall Hospital. Surprisingly, I was honestly scared to go there because it doesn't have a good reputation, but surprisingly they're birth ward is really impressive but they tried for like almost four days to keep me to try to keep the baby and me at a low blood pressure but by the fourth day I had went over to 200 over 111 and they just they said we can't we're sorry mama we tried we have to get the baby out because uh, you could get placental tearing and, and um, hemorrhaging and the placenta can rip 
So anyway, so I had a, a birth, first birth in an hour and 15 minutes, they got him out vaginally. But ever since then, I've had really extreme um, issues with walking, like my tailbone, my my hip bones and my back uh, for the first, it took me nine months to walk again after giving birth. It was my, le my left leg would not go down. So my question is like, to get the body back, can you still do the wrapping even like 19 months after a birth? Or is that something that you have to do right away? No, yeah, like the, the wrapping can be done immediately after birth the, and, and then, um, you know, those 40 days. But I've met moms who like, you know, they've come to the sweat lodge and they have like six, seven kids and they never had one. And then, you know, they have a, a, a full medical report and all these issues going on, back pain and hip pain and, you know, like a lot of different things. And, and um, yeah, like the, the medicines in the sweat, some tea, the lodge itself or, or the teepee, but the binding, you can do it now every day and, and it helps it. Um, and, 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 and I've had, yeah, moms who are like, well, you know, my, my son's 30 something. Can I still have it? And, and, and the grandma, she told me, yeah, like, she's like, do it, do it for them. And then, you know, once, once someone who, who, who we know how to do it, does it, then we just teach someone who's close to you and then keep trying to do it as much as you can. I, myself, every time I do seven, I get one done on myself. And, um, but yeah, that will help you with all that. But that's, I mean, yeah, that's pretty good. They let you go all those days that long with the pre -cancer. Yeah, they tried, but he was like, nope, I'm coming out today, mom. That's it. I gotta. And it's interesting that you speak about birth as ceremony. I mean, it's not something I, I talk about publicly, but I guess we're here and we just might as well go there. But I, I saw my grandmother, I saw my uncle, and I saw my grandfather, and they're all dead. They were, I literally saw them. And the interesting thing was I saw, I honestly think, I'm be real with you, I think I was between. I, at that moment, I really think I was between, because I remember seeing um, a, a sacred spirit that I'm not going to talk about. And I remember telling the spirit, I can't go yet. I haven't seen my son. And right there is when I don't know what happened just he started coming out and then I, I had um, my son with me but it was very intense and I think that people it is definitely a ceremony and and like you said before it's it's very powerful it's sometimes hard to explain in words unless you've gone through that ceremony but you literally are between worlds or however your traditional people call it or, or names that they have it and it's really intense you know um so I really appreciate medicine and birth workers like you that kind of say wait a minute it's not just medical there's something really sacred happening here that western science doesn't understand and hasn't caught up with um Oh, thank you, Yao. Yao says, thank you all for this amazing lesson, Brooke. Stay strong, warrior. You too. Love you, Yao. So I'm just really uh, grateful for spaces like this because I don't think it's talked about enough. Um, and it's just important to just talk about the spiritual aspect of, of what's happening because it's definitely just not medical. It's not. It's more than that. Yeah. Thanks for sharing that because it's true. Like, I mean, I've, um, you know, not all babies and moms decide to stay there. And the way we understand it is like, um, you, you are in that, in that, uh, you know, it, it's, it's that thin line between life and death. And for the most part, I've always seen life and, and beauty, but you know, there are those times when the baby didn't make it and sometimes mom doesn't make it and, and you know, like, or the mom made it, but the baby didn't. And she's really connected with, you know, her her ancestry, that lineage, and and had the dreams before. And then, you know, like the the baby chose to stay with the ancestors and and did her or his, you know, journey in in the earth in those seconds before transition or days before transition to the spirit world. So it's um 
that's why I, I, you know, I, I was taught a mentor, midwife. She's like, you know, you keep praying. Like I, the way I pray in the lodge and the teepee at Sundance, like the, the 24 seven, you know, is as we go into the, that, that, that journey, that prayer is the same at birth. Like uh, even everything from what I wear to, to, you know, the weepy, the skirts, the fajas, the huaraches, the obsidian in my belly button, or, you know, everything from what I wear for protection and treating it and presenting self to creator creation to mother creator, father creator, like as, as, you know, as humbly as I can and, and, and just really, you know, keep praying until baby's out, but then it doesn't end with the baby because sometimes after the baby, everyone's to celebrate, but I'm like, no, 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 until the grandmother placenta is out, that's when we, then we vocally, you know, out, out loud, I'll say a prayer. And that's how I end all the births. Like after the placenta is out, then um, the parents, if sometimes the grandparents are there, other relatives, they will all share a prayer out loud and give thanks to creator for that miracle of life because not all babies decide to stay. And then, yeah, I think talking to many mothers, like you shared, like you, you, those different spirit beings, thunder beings, different people come and those lessons are learned in those few seconds sometimes, sometimes minutes. So it's like a really beautiful journey and, um, and it, it helps us, it helps us in our everyday life. So, yeah. Well, I don't know if anybody wants to comment. We kind of got like real deep for a second, but we don't have to just say we could have like general questions too. It doesn't have to always be so uh, deep down the rabbit hole. I got a general question. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> okay, so I was born with uh, basically all of my, my natal teeth. All of my, my teeth were already out. And I was wondering how many, have you seen any other children born with their, with their teeth out already? My mother couldn't breastfeed me. She had to give me a sippy cup. Wow. No, I, I personally haven't seen them, but in school we had to identify and then, yeah, there, but not, not all the teeth, usually just like um, the front two or some. No, I had, um, I had six on the top. Wow. And then I had, um, wait, yeah, because it was one, two, three, four, five, six. And I know I had one set less on the bottom. And so, so that would have been like, if that was six at the top. Let me do some finger math, okay? That would be four on the bottom. <laughs> I had four on the bottom and six at the top. And wow. by the time, I, I think by the time, you know, hey, I gotta use my fingers to count, okay? I can't do that mental math. Um, by the time um, I hit like four years old or something, those teeth were so, you know, old. So, like, you know, I was always at the dentist, you know, even when I was little, you know, cause they were trying to take out cavities and stuff. You know, your little baby is always trying to eat sugary stuff, you know, trying not to brush their teeth. So yeah, um, those, those natal teeth, by the time I started losing my teeth, I mean, they were ready to go. <laughs> <laughs> I've never heard of anybody else being born with, with teeth. No, I, I, yeah, personally, I haven't seen just in the photos. Yeah. No. What is the weirdest thing you've seen? Well, not weirdest, but like the different, most different. Um, well, I've only seen this one time, um, a twin home birth, and then one baby was born. Um, and the whole pregnancy, both babies were head down, cephalic presentation, but in labor, oh. babies rotated. So one baby was born like complete breach, like the butt came out first, everything, and then was was good. And then the, the next one, the baby was born 14 hours later. So the next day, and then came out foot, foot footling breach. So for a while, all you could see was like four toes sticking out of a Yoni right there and then dipping in and out and um and that was a hard one because uh, oh, both were breached both turned last minute and it's been the only twin home birth i've seen um so far 
because uh, one, they're illegal in New Jersey and then in New York, they're legal, but you know, they're considered high risk. And so that's been, yeah, because there's a lot of similarities in birth and everything, but that's been one that, that, uh, that uh, stands out. Yeah. I'm laughing at the idea of a state trying to make it illegal for the baby to, to, to want to come out a certain way. Oh yeah, um, in New Jersey, I mean, just across New York, it's different. In Jersey, V-backs are illegal, twin births are illegal, and breach are illegal for a home birth. So those three, uh, yeah, you gotta be in New York. And I don't know how it is all throughout Turtle Island, but yeah, the state comes up with all those laws, you know. That feels like ownership to me. I didn't know that neither. I did not know that, that it's illegal. I know it's illegal to do a titty swap. Like you can't, like if I have milk, I can't give it to my sister's baby technically without, you know, it's illegal for that stuff to do titty swaps. But I didn't know about the, the birth aspect of it. Yeah, wow. Well, we're coming to the end of our show. We actually went over by like two or three minutes, but we got into like titty swaps and then like foot breach and four toes coming out. So it was good stuff. It was good stuff. Colonialism, of course, colonialism. <laughs> of course, colonialism. <laughs> That's right, Rand. Free the titties, free the nipples. Okay, stop telling moms to cover their nips. That is her feeding center for her child. <laughs> that is more than just sexual objects. You know, that's not just for, you know, people who are into titties. All right. For babies too. And it's for moms, it's their business, what they do with their nipples. All right. And with that closed caption, yeah, free the titties. Hashtag free the titties. Is there anything else you would like to say? Oh, you want to have a closing statement to Karima or anything before we close out? Yeah, I just so, um Ometeo, Tlasokamati, at Eheka, Tlali Tle, Tlasoteo, Tlanancin Tlali, Kolikwe, Shachuit Likwe, Nimis Tlasotla, Pamparyo, Statewari, Hikuri, Kayumari. And uh, just thankful to Creator for you know, for this uh, conversation here, just uh, this, this shares all the, the, the words that were exchanged and, um, you know, the prayer is to continue to increase the home births uh, all throughout Turtle Island, throughout the world, and that our children are born to our Mother Earth in a beautiful, just uh, normal, natural physiological birth as ceremony and at the same time giving thanks to all the babies born right now in this minute and uh you know just a little while ago and, and later and um yeah uh that we continue to to just like we shared already break down those systems of power of, of white supremacy and patriarchy and capitalism and heterosexism and how it's taken over birth and that we continue to take birth back one by one, one mother at a time and um, have that postpartum care really on point and, uh, and that we continue to live long, strong lives like our ancestors connected with the plants, with the sacred foods for many years, you know, some of us want to get past the hundred years. So, uh, and see our children be free from all those cycles of violence, addictions, and all that. So always, that's the, always the prayers, prayers for, for all the babies are the children's that are holy, innocent, and um, have good role models. You know, it's not just, it doesn't, Birth is ceremony and it doesn't end there. Life is ceremony. So we all have to do our part. And that's the, the big prayer, always what we pray for. So just uh, just share that much here. And thank you. Very honored to have been able to share this space, this little time this evening with you all. Um, 
I'm always concerned if I'm going to be at a birth or something, but it all worked out. So thanks. Thanks to Kaima. Thanks, thanks everybody for coming. Uh, just letting you know that next week we'll be having our panel. Uh, the topic is going to be breast milk as food sovereignty, where we will have Tikarima, Phoenix, and Rayanne back for the panel. You know, we always collect our, create a community of teachers at the end of each month. That's going to be on Wednesday, 7 p.m. Uh, do we have any other announcements, Desiree, before we close out? Do you maybe want to tell people, well, one, I think Kristenia is coming back to, mo to moderate our panel. Everybody loves Lynchy Kristenia, which I do too. I think she's on this call still. Hey, Kristenia. Um, but Brooke, do you want to tell people the things that you were making the new flyers for? Just to oh, kind of get a teaser? Yes. Yeah, so next month, uh, our theme, because we're going to be switching. So we went from breast milk as food sovereignty. Next month is going to be... Um, First families in it. Hello? That was odd. What Can happened? Yeah. Okay, my whole computer just went blank, like out of nowhere. I was like, what? Oh. Okay, mm -hmm. so, so back on track. So anyway, <laughs> so next month we're gonna have first families is our theme. So we're going to be learning from uh, th various different topics, but we're going to have Kari Skulo, we're going to have uh, Emma uh, Jolie, we're going to have Mary Upwam, as well as my brain. We have four teachers. Oh, Yvonne Dennis. So everyone's going to be talking about different things, fruit, uh, fruit leathers to um, blackberry teas to felt salmon uh, toy making. So everything for kids and families, it's going to be pretty fun next month. Mm -hmm. Good stuff. Well, thank you everyone for joining us. Uh, again, we'd just like to thank our partner, Ibex Puppetry, for the ongoing support to make First Foods happen. We look forward to seeing you next week. And just thank you to our instructor and to our participants. Um, yeah, just thank you and we'll catch you next time. Be well. Bye, take care. Bye. It was really thank good. Thank you. Could I just make one comment real quick, okay? Sure. When, um, when you were talking about the, um, that women who give fear don't give healthy birth. Well, and then you told the story about, you know, the women who, um, have to have to give birth and then take off. It made me think of all the Lakota stories I heard about her women who uh, they were moving camp because maybe they heard that an enemy tribe or the uh, cavalry or somebody was coming, and they would just pack up and take off. And if a woman was went into labor during that time and she felt that birth was impending, then she would just stop and find a sheltered space in a spruce area or something and squat have the baby wrap the baby in something get up and go catch up with the with the tribe i mean indigenous women are so strong we are so strong yep so i really enjoyed this tonight and and i was here i just have not been feeling all that well and uh and so i just um wanted to listen it, oh, it was wonderful thank you so much I'm so glad that I have this place to come to. Thanks. Mm -hmm. Nice to hey, see goodbye. you. <laughs> All right. Thank you, Christina. You just you're just sweet. I know we should. Mm -hmm. <laughs> she, she's just sweet. <laughs> All right, uh, everyone. Have a nice week. Right. Thank okay. you. Bye. Bye. Take care. Bye. Later. Bye. Oh. <laughs>